One, two, three, fuck it. Connection. We'll wait and see for just a moment. I hear some noise. You think they're coming? I think so. Yes. I hear them. I hear them. Here they come. There's one. And I think some others that are coming. On the air they are. <laughs> Yay. All right. How's everybody doing today? Okay, school is you're in full throes of school, and and school is no longer a novelty, and now it's boring, right? Okay, well, I hope you're still having a good time at school. Uh, I have something in my hand. Which hand are you going to pick? Oh, this is. Ha! Yes, there it is. Uh, what do I have? A penny. a penny. It's a coin. It's a penny. And can you buy a lot with one penny? No, you sure can't, okay? You really cannot. But let's imagine, I mean, I think I found out between, between worship services, you know, we worship at 832, somebody said that actually there is such, still such a thing as penny candy, okay? And so you have to look for it a little bit, like root beer barrels, you know what I'm talking about? That those might be pieces, those are penny candies. But let's imagine that, that this is one of 25 pennies that you have but you've lost one, and you, ha you can buy something for 25 cents, and you have in mind exactly what you want to buy. I don't know what that would be. That would be a quarter. Okay, that would be a quarter, wouldn't it? But you don't have a quarter. You have 25 of these, but you've lost one. You can't buy something for 25 cents if you've lost one coin, right? 24 cents isn't going to cut it for you. Come on up and have a seat. So if you lost it, what are you going to do? And you really, 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 really need this. You could look for it. You could look under your bed. Yes. You could turn the house upside down. <laughs> you guys are good because you've already covered this in Sunday school today, haven't you? Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. You can turn the whole house upside down, inside out. Uh, if, in, if you come to my house and you feel in the couch between the cushions, you could probably find a bunch of change in there anyway. Yeah, what's that? And you could, well, on the roof might be a little on the dangerous side, but you could look all over the place. And if you found that penny, it'd be pretty happy news, wouldn't it? And you would rejoice. Well, you've already learned from Sunday school today that there is a story, a parable that Jesus tells about a woman who had 10 silver coins. Now, this isn't silver, this is copper. But 10 silver coins, and she loses one. So she upends the whole house, looks for it, and she finds it. And then she goes out and she rejoices and she shouts in the whole neighborhood and says, look, I found my coin. And then Jesus says that that is exactly the way God is with us when we maybe do some wrong things or we move farther away from God. God goes out and looks for us and brings us back because God loves us that much. Pretty good news, right? Here's your assignment for the week. Give, find out if there's such a thing as penny candy, okay? Yes? Up out by the cabin. Okay, yeah, that's probably true. Okay, well, uh, maybe the rest of you can find that out. But in the meantime, let's fold our hands, let's bow our heads, let's talk to God, please. Thank you, God, for loving us so very, very much that you will keep looking and searching for us if we move away from you, and keep looking and searching for other people who need your love too. Thank you, God, for loving us. Amen. Amen is right. All right, thank you very much for coming up and talking with me. I always look forward to it. Bye. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. For as long as I can remember, 
it seemed that I was invited to look upon these two parables in today's gospel, to look upon them only through the lens of the church's responsibility toward the lost. Moreover, the working definition of the lost was anyone who was not occupying a place in a pew in any church around this country. Now that makes for a pretty narrow understanding of the text, don't you think? It had the look of something vaguely evangelistic, or at least it was couched in the language of evangelism. To be sure, Jesus was the one who searched for the lost and thus used those two parables as a way of lifting up his rationale for doing so because of the extravagance of his love so that a shepherd who leaves 99 sheep behind to go find one shares love in an extravagant way. So too, the woman who sweeps and cleans diligently in her house until one lost coin is found. But as in my formative years anyway, but uh, the message that I took away for years was that I should also be like Jesus. Now that's not a bad thing, mind you, but it is really still a very narrowly defined way of looking at these parables. Look for the lost, was the word. Search out those who were on the fringes of community. But that's my job. That's my responsibility. It is the church's responsibility. It is your responsibility. Leave the rest behind, we are told, and go out and look for one who is absent. So I have to tell you that in my Sunday school years, in my confirmation years, in all of the years leading up to my ordination and even beyond, these parables have haunted me for most of those years. Jesus' words have a burden attached to them today. That's not a bad thing either. Sometimes we are called upon to bear that weight of discipleship. There are no guarantees. The Jesus pathway is an easy one to follow, neither his commands. But think about this with me, if you would. That posture of seeking the lost as Jesus tells the parables and as Luke presents them to us really does not seem to be the place that Jesus starts or the narrative as we have it from Luke begins. Notice what is missing in these two stories. This is not like the Good Samaritan. There is no command to go and do likewise. The stories are descriptive rather than proscriptive. Fundamentally, they are a response to Pharisaic criticism. You know, the rabble over here, the Pharisees who are grumbling and mumbling about the way that Jesus has been hanging out with the wrong sort of people. The wrong sort are drawn to Jesus like flies to honey. It is one thing to be an attraction to a lower element of society. It is an entirely different thing to seemingly pander to them. And so comes the murmuring. He sits at table eating and drinking with the lowest of the low. Doesn't he know what that looks like? And look, he actually seems to be enjoying himself. How can Jesus do that, knowing what he knows about all of them? Think about that for just a moment. Let that sink in. And then ask yourself this question. If Jesus' response to this sort of criticism is to tell a couple of stories about why he spends time with the so-called riffraff, how can we genuinely make the leap to hearing Jesus say that we have to go out and do likewise? To be sure, 
There is a tacit understanding that as we have been found by Jesus, that we are called as well to search others out and find those who have not somehow found a place at the table of grace. But in doing that, in doing so, we've skipped a step in the process. Because you see, the assumption is that we have never been in that place where we have been the riffraff. What if we need to stop and consider that there have been plenty of times in our own lives when we haven't felt welcomed to the table of grace? Maybe we need to come clean about who we are and where we have been. Because you see, at various times in our lives, we are riffraff. What if the lost are found not out there, but sitting right in here in the pews that we occupy? What if they are in full view right here and right now? What if they are we? Luke's gospel tends to upend everything throughout the whole of the gospel narrative. The A-listers get displaced. The unsavory are the ones who are lifted up. We've seen this pattern over and over again throughout this past year in which the gospel of Luke is featured. It begins with Mary's song. God has scattered the proud and has lifted up the lowly, we hear. It also is carried through and made known through a child whose parents are unable to find any suitable place to stay for his mother to give birth. He gets into trouble with the religious authorities almost from the very beginning and ultimately is executed because he finds himself on the wrong side of the law. Jesus insists on hanging around with gluttons and drunkards. He keeps intentionally carving out time for them. And there is a certain implicit call to consider all of the implications of grace and righteousness in this tableau. To go out and find the lost is still on the table as far as discipleship is concerned. No one would take it off. But maybe the better starting point for us, the better one for everyone, is sitting in the lowest places first, in humility, to consider those times when we, we have been more humble than we are at all comfortable in acknowledging. Because once we come to terms with our own lostness, whatever that looks like, we can have greater compassion for others who are or sometimes feel lost. So consider these questions in the depths of your spirit. Are there dark places in your lives when you have felt utterly excluded from anything that is life affirming? Have you felt so lost that you were pretty sure that no one could pluck you out of the depths? Were you so fearful of going home, wherever home is, where you knew that the expectations of where you would be by this time in your life were in no way matched up with the realities that you faced in the moment? Were you so afraid to return that you stayed as far away as possible with no explanation as to why you did that? Have you ever felt like you were an absolute failure? A failure at relationships, at work, at life. Have you ever felt that alone? And have you felt as if there was no place 
at the table of grace and that there never would be a place at that table for you. A story, if I may. My mother was the youngest of five children. Her closest sibling in age was my uncle Max. Max was the quintessential hail fellow well met. He was popular within his circle of friends. He was handsome. He was the high school sports hero, and he positively dripped with girlfriends, so I'm told. He seemed to lead with this innate ability that he possessed of charm. He was, in fact, a very charming man, even as I remember him to be that way. This was his way of being to achieve some notoriety or some measure of success. It was the way that he understood himself. But Max seemed to have difficulty with relationships that required depth and work and intimacy. He married twice, and in both instances, there was more than enough evidence to suggest that there was plenty of unfaithfulness on the part of all parties concerned. Max had moved to Santa Barbara with his second wife, and the last time he was with any of us as a family was at my grandmother's funeral in 1967. He left, and in spite of the best efforts of everyone in our family to stay in touch with him, in spite of the cards and the letters, yes, we wrote letters back in those days, and telephone calls and all manner of trying to reach out and stay connected to him, no matter what we tried, He wasn't heard from again until my mother received a phone call in 1993. And the phone call was that her brother was reported missing in this little logging town in Northern California called Weaverville. Not long after that, not long after that initial phone call, the sheriff found the remains of my Uncle Max in a remote area of the county, accidentally locked out of his car, maybe, maybe not, having died of overexposure to freezing winter temperatures. That following summer, we went to settle his affairs and short, sorted through all of his belongings, and we had always lived sort of with the understanding that he really didn't have anything to do with us because he didn't really want to have anything to do with any of us. But what we found in his tiny apartment spoke to a different reality. Boxes and boxes, opened boxes, of family pictures of all of us, or I might say the younger version of all of us, because they had never been updated over the years. We were all sort of frozen in time for him. Would he have connected with us if he had had the emotional capacity to do so? Was there something in him that felt as if he were the family outcast and somehow was ashamed to reach out for us? Or was he just more comfortable living at a distance with us and having to live only with the safety of his own memory? No answers to that ever. And really, it isn't all that unusual of a story, if you think about it. Because maybe some of the emotion behind that is descriptive of where you and I have been at various times in our lives, far from the light of acceptability. And maybe you are in that place right now. I don't know, and I certainly wouldn't want to speculate. You might not look lost to any of us, because we do hold our cards pretty close to the vest. After all, you are here. 
But the narrative of your own self-understanding, the negative messages at the, that point somehow and accuse us or you, and those things that try to pull you away from the flock, destroy anything that affirms and speaks to God's unconditional grace. That Jesus speaks to the unbridled joy of finding the lost sheep or the lost coin means that you are of value. You are his child. Never doubt that. What any of us have done or not done in this life will never be the final measure of our worth in God's sight. The final witness of God's persistent love is found in the cross. And what happens in that place seals God's relationship with us forever. We are never, never lost to him. Amen. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you.